Okay, so this is the title of my talk, Molecular to Cellular Mechanics Pro by High Speed for Spectroscopy. Um, so I'm interested in mechanics of cells and molecules. And why? Because mechanical forces are essential for cell function. In tissues like the muscle, this is uh, obvious. Um, muscle is made to generate mechanical force, but in other tissues like is, uh, like the islands in the in our eye that from allows us to focus from far and from close, uh, certain flexibility of the tissue is also important to undergo function. So this was kind of known long time ago by uh, pioneers in in the field, but I think the the development of nanotechnologies like optical tweezers or the biomembrane force probe boosted or enhanced the field because they allow us to measure uh, picker newton forces and manipulate individual molecules and cells with nanometer resolution. So I'm interested in the mechanics behind biological uh, and cellular processes. And to understand this, I think that it's important to have uh, different perspectives and go from different length scales from the single molecule to the cells themselves, but also different time scales from microseconds of individual uh, molecule movements to minutes or even hours of uh, whole cell processes. And for me, I've now been, I'm introducing to other techniques, but mainly I've been working with atomic force microscopy and that's what I will focus today. So just a reminder, atomic force microscopy works similar to a, a record player. Uh, there is a cantilever which is flexible and has a tip at the end, and this allows us to scan the sample surface in liquid environment and ambient pressure and temperature, and this provides information about the topography at the nanometer scale, as you can see here from uh, the purple membrane uh, bacteriodopsin uh, forming uh, this lattice. We can also use it as a force sensor, and then we have the measurements. We can make measurements of single molecules unfolding or unbinding, or even we can push on cells and measure the mechanical properties, or we can combine the two and provide topography and mechanical properties on the same sample. So today I'll focus on these two examples on single molecules and cells as uh, using AFM as a tool for mechanical measurements. One of the drawbacks of AFM is that it's relatively slow and an image like this one will take uh, several minutes and force measurements like this will have a resolution of a few tens or hundreds of microseconds. So the development of high-speed atomic force microscopy, I think changed uh, our perspective on how molecules move. And this was importantly developed by uh, Toshio Ando in Kanazawa University who miniaturized most of the elements like the piezoelectric elements and improve the electronics, but importantly allow the use of very small cantilevers, much smaller than conventional AFM. And with that, they provided a thousand times faster imaging grades than conventional AFM. And with this uh, technique, they are able to obtain images or movies like these, which I think they should be in all molecular biology biology textbook. This is an actin filament, and this is a, a myosin-5 molecule walking on it in real time under liquid conditions. So I think that's uh, fantastic, but uh, unfortunately, I'm a force spectroscopist and not a microscopist, so I will not show many other movies on high speed AFM. Sorry about that. But uh, we thought that uh, that could be a tool to to do force measurements at high speed. And indeed, one of the first measurements on force spectroscopy using AFM was the unfolding of a multi-domain uh, protein titan from the muscle. And they that was pioneered by the group of Hermann Gaub. And what they observed is that each domain, globally in like domain, unfold as a peak, um, showing a peak in the force versus distance trace. And each peak corresponded to the unfolding of one domain. This resulted in a, what we call the force, dynamic force spectrum, in which we measure the force as a function of the falling velocity. And to understand the process at the atomic scale, people normally use molecular dynamic simulations, uh, which was 
pioneered by uh, the group of Carl Schulten and mimic the unfolding of uh, the experimental AFM measurements. But since this is very computationally demanding, the unfolding has to be carried out or the pulling velocity has to be much faster, orders of magnitude faster, which leads to much higher forces of unfolding. And indeed, the experiments and the simulations cannot really be compared, and there is a gap that we thought could be filled with the application of high-speed AFM. So we modified slightly the optical path. Uh, we changed the sample uh, state to reduce the viscous drag, and you, we used the golden standard type in I91 optimer. And again, we use these very small cantilevers that you can see here that are much, much smaller than conventional AFM uh, cantilevers. And this provides faster, or much uh, higher uh, resonance frequencies in the hundreds of kilohertz. And this allows us to measure the relaxation time of these cantilevers. This is a conventional cantilever, MLCTE which has a response time of about 44 microseconds with the conventional, with the high speed AFM cantilever AC10, what we can reach is the order of microseconds or sub-microseconds. So we applied this system to unfold tightening and we were able to pull at millimeter per second velocity with microsecond time resolution. And this allow us to fill the gap between experiments and simulations. So now we have a, an atomic description of the system by molecular dynamic simulations, but we are supporting these simulations with experimental results. So we can really compare the two and, and, and confirm that the, the simulations are, are properly done or given what, what we are observing during experiment. Okay, so I'm interested in, in binding receptor like and interactions. And one of the first systems that was probed with AFM was streptavid in biotin, again, again by the group of Herman Gaub. And um, this was later used also the streptavid in biotin system as a, as a proof of concept to show or to develop the theory behind dynamic force spectroscopy by the group of Evan Evans. Uh, streptavidin is this uh, protein that forms a beta viral that binds biotin, which is a very small molecule with a very long lifetime uh, in the order of days. And this is very used in molecular biology. And it's uh, also used in single molecule biophysics as an immobilization method. So this was measured experimentally by different techniques. And soon after the first measurements, the molecular dynamic simulations were applied by the group of Klaus Schulten, relating and showing that the energy landscape they obtained in the experiments um, that was interpreted as, as different barriers being crossed during the unbinding was also somehow reproduced during uh, the simulations. And this also was developed by Ruth Mueller, and they allow, they were able to describe the atomic processes during the unbinding uh, events. Again, the problem was that these experiments were carried out in the micrometer per second regime, while the simulations were much faster. So in this case, we have a much higher gap. And the aim was to fill this gap, combining high speed for spectroscopy and steel molecular dynamic simulations. And the final goal was trying to understand if filling this gap and having much wider dynamic range will allow us to have a more detail or an explanation of uh, where is the origin of this long lifetime of the streptavidin biotin complex. So we use uh, uh, small cantilevers functionalized with the PEC uh, ending with the biotin molecule and we use streptavidin agarose beads which have the uh, tetrameric form streptavidin. In this case, the force group looked like this. So we approach, we make contact. If we are lucky, we pull on one uh, bond form and it will break at a certain force that will depend on the loading rate. If we carry out this at different pulling velocities, we can get information about the energy landscape uh, through the dynamic force spectrum. 
of force versus load increase. So we apply this, our system of high speed AFM and we were able to pull it about eight millimeters per second and using uh, slightly smaller cantilevers, which was a gift of Professor Ando, we were able to pull at 30 millimeters per second. From each one of these pulling velocities, we generated a histogram and from each one, this allows us to get um, the dynamic force spectrum and fill half of the gap between experiments and simulations. To fill the other part, we needed molecular dynamic simulations down to these velocities. So we asked the uh, people of uh, Helmut Rubmuller in the Max Planck Institute, and they simulated the, the very same experimental conditions that we had in AFM. So they simulated a peg linker and a cantilever with the very same spin constant. And this um, allowed them to have this type of movies in which we see variety and binding from, from the spectral binding property. And the force curves from the simulations look very similar to the ones we obtained. They carry out more than 900 simulations going down to the millimeter per second regime. And from all these velocities, they were able to get this. Uh, histogram of, uh, of distribution of forces, and these allow us to fill the half of the other gap. Here I'm showing force versus velocity, but the relevant parameter is actually the loading rate. Uh, so that's how it should look like. And as we can see, the experiments and the simulations look very much uh, coincident. So the agreement is very good in the overlapping regime. I put here two types of simulations. So first, the simulations were carried out in the monomer, and we saw that there was a big mismatch between the forces that we were measuring at the overlapping regime. And after talking with uh, Klaus Schultz, then he suggested that we should actually simulate the full tetramer. And indeed, this show us that the forces were slightly higher and were much better um, in much better agreement with the experiments. So this shows how powerful is being able to directly compare the experiments and the simulations because we can tune one with the other and um, get much more accurate results and interpretations. Um, so this is the full uh, spectrum. And to explain it, we needed uh, a complex energy landscape. And for that, we use Brownian dynamic simulations uh, with uh, an energy landscape with two barriers. However, with this energy landscape and this simulate Brownian and dynamic simulations, the expected, um, uh, sorry, the uh, lifetime of this bond at zero force was in the order of seconds, which is far away from the base that is expected or measured from bulk measurements. So we thought that maybe that was not enough to understand the, the long life tip. So we went into uh, a detailed analysis of the molecular dynamic simulations. And what I'm showing here is the distribution of, from all the trajectories, from all the simulations, the distribution of distances between the centers of mass of biotin and the binding property of streptavidin. So you have a huge peak at uh, zero because that's the binding state. So that most of the molecules will be there. Then when we start pulling, they will visit other binding states. And the, uh, these are shown reflected by these other peaks and the valleys will be the barriers. And indeed, the distances that we found from, from some of the barriers are very similar to the ones we observed during the, from the energy landscape reconstructed from the dynamic core spectrum. However, farther away from this distance of the energy landscape, we also saw some, uh, peak of, some distribution of positions, which told us that there, was, there were maybe other binding states outer uh, in the outer region. And this is uh, what we observe from the simulations that some unbinding events look like this one in which when it comes out, it comes out directly. And sometimes 
uh, other simulations look like this, in which biotin unbinds, it slightly and transiently binds to another region, and then it unbinds completely. So there are multiple binding unbinding pathways, and these uh, we thought that might be reflected in the unbinding forces. And that's what we observe that uh, the unbinding force simulations of these specific events in which we see a, a transient binding uh, had this transient peak after the main unfolding, uh, sorry, unbinding. Uh, and from that, we could measure some lifetime of this uh, transient binding at a certain force. And then we went back to the experiments and we thought that maybe we were able to see that with the microsecond time resolution. And indeed, in some events, we were able to see this long uh, 100 microseconds or even 10 or even shorter uh, events at a given force. And this was telling us that there might be yeah, some other binding events that happen after, far away from this energy landscape that we reconstructed. So we plotted this lifetime as a function of the uh, apparent or effective uh, force. And we compare experiments again and simulations. And we saw that the, the agreement uh, was very good. And what we think that is happening and what the relevance of this uh, finding is that if we compare how long it will take for biotin to get out of the binding pocket, if there is no uh, rebinding, it's about uh, a few nanoseconds or one nanosecond. Instead, with this unbinding or transient binding, we have uh, tens of microseconds, and this will favor rebinding in bulk. And this may explain why the, the the lifetime is so long in bulk compared to, to this type of experiments in which we have uh, an applied force. OK, so let me conclude this part. So we use high speed uh, for spectroscopy. We develop, and it can cover about 11 decades in loading grade with microsecond time resolution. And when we couple it with molecular dynamic simulations, we have an atomic description based on experimental results. We are now working on more biologically relevant uh, processes like addition molecules. We are working on the interim ligand interaction of, uh, in the context of glucosides. And we are also working on cell mechanics and that's uh, what I will talk about uh, just now. So the cell, now we change the scale. We go to the, to the full cell and in the micrometer scale. So the cell, is a complex system and it uh, maintains the shape and generate mechanical forces through a complex uh, filament network called the cytoskeleton, which can have different um, arrangements depending on the function. This leads to a relatively complex mechanical response. And this was shown early uh, with the cell poker. And you can see here that uh, if you apply a force and measure the, the deformation, uh, you can see that if you pull, you push and retract, there is some certain hysteresis that tells us that the system is uh, dissipating energy. And if we pull faster, we see that it becomes or look like it's stiffer and the hysteresis also becomes more, more obvious, which tells us that the cell behaves like a viscoelastic system. So we can, um, describe the viscoelasticity with the complex shear modulus, which has a term in phase, which is given the elastic uh, term and an out of phase term, which is describing the, the viscous part of the, of the, of the system. Um, so the mechanical properties of cells have been measured with many different techniques and it's been shown that the, at low frequencies or up to a, a few tens or hundred thirds, the system can be described with the phenomenological soft glass rheology that describes a weak power law in which G prime is higher. So the elastic term is higher than the viscous term, but they increase with the weak power law in parallel. So they are coupled. At higher 
frequencies or velocities in this work by, by Deng and the people, Fredberg group in, in, at Harvard, they suggested that the high frequency response was universal and was due to the dynamics of individual uh, filaments. And they predicted that the exponent of this power law would be three quarters. And in this case, the viscous term is higher than the elastic term. And this was due to some theory or it was a prediction of a semi-flexible filament theory in which the triangular fluctuations will give rise to these uh, three quarters as an exponent. However, there are other predictions like seven eighths due to uh, longitudinal filament uh, fluctuations or uh, one half if you have a tense uh, filament. So we wanted to go into this high frequency regime and we thought that uh, the high speed AFM was, was a good tool. So we good. adapted the system. Three minutes. Okay, to, to have um, transmitted light and we use these very small cantilevers with the sphere at the end and we applied low amplitude oscillations to have the um, unbinding, uh, sorry, the force versus indentation loop and then with some um, theory behind, we can obtain the viscous and elastic term of the system. And if we observe, we go a thousand, a hundred times faster than other techniques. And in this case, what we observed was uh, an exponent of about 0 0.9, which is closer to the seven eights expected from the loss including our fluctuations. And this might be related to the cortical uh, acting that is what we are measuring. And then we compare cancer uh, cells, benign and malignant cells, and we saw that the benign cells have a more relaxed cytoskeleton with an exponent in the order of 0 0.9. And in the other hand, malignant cells have this 0 0.4, which is close to the prediction of a 10 cytoskeleton of about 0 0.5. So that was the, the, the main conclusion. And now we are going into more detail and we know that the cell is an heterogeneous system and we have a cytoskeleton that may have different mechanical properties in different locations. And there is the, the work of the de la Carilla who is finishing her PhD and is doing now this very nice work with micro patterns and combining um, mechanical maps and microbiology and polarization fluorescence and microscopy. So with that, let me finish by thanking the people involved in, in all this work. So the development of high-speed AFM was carried out a few years ago already with uh, the help of Ignacio Casuso, Laura Montalit, and, and Simon Shoring, the director of the lab at that moment. Um, the work on streptavidin biotin, it's uh, been working in collaboration with Ruth Muller and Andreas Rusek in, in Göttingen. And um, I would like to thank the other members of the group, the funding, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Felix, for that great talk. Um, there's a couple questions in, in the chat. Um, the first from uh, David Sidak. I'm struck by how gradual the unfolding force increases over many orders of magnitude of loading rates. Have you thought about what loading rates you need to exceed the unfolding speed limit and see a sharp increase in unfolding force? There's a second part, but I think I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah. So, sorry, that was the, so have you thought about what loading rates you have need? Yeah, the unfolding speed limit. Well, I'm not sure if I understand what that means. Um, but um, I can think of the, what people call the deterministic limit in the unfolding or unbinding uh, in which thermal fluctuations are no longer relevant. I'm not sure if we can reach that point. We claim that we were reaching that point in the original uh, work. Um, but then thinking about it, it's, um, it's a, already a theoretical problem. In, in which I think we can give um, 
some insight. And I think it will depend on the system itself. So some systems like a protein that it's very large, which will have a slow relaxation time uh, or long relaxation time, we maybe are able to reach this uh, limit. In other system like the biotin streptidin, we are far from it and only with molecular dynamics can be, can be reached. Um, then the second question. Yeah, that's I answer, I think. Um, okay, sounds like maybe we, if there's more discussion, we can do that during the informal session. Let's, let's move on to the, the next question from um, Raphael Petrosian. Um, your, your experimental unfolding force distributions in the streptavidin biotin study uh, had a right tail, unlike the MD simulations and the predictions by most DFS models. Can you comment on that? They have a right tail. Uh, I guess that's this tail here in the distribution. Yes. So that's what we think that this is coming from the from double bonds. So we cannot uh, really assure. But what we did is to fit uh, double exponential, and we kept the the first peak coming. Um, it could be other unbinding pathways, but um, since what we observe in the experiments and the simulations match so well, we thought that these are probably um, given happening with multiple bonds. Okay, I think we have time for one more short question before we go on to the next talk from Diego Kraft. Um, you observe mechanical responses on the cell that depend on velocity and position. Do they also depend on how deep you push into the cell? Okay. Hi, Diego, how are you? <laughs> um, I am, yeah, I'm pretty sure that they depend on how um, deep we, we press. And actually what we are trying to, to do is to see the distribution of forces and eventually correct for the bottom effect. So there is a bottom effect if we are growing cells on a rigid substrate that will affect very much the, the, the mechanical response that we are measuring. Uh, but I believe that, yes, it will depend. And if we indent too much, for example, we start to see the mechanical properties of the nucleus if we are close to the nucleus or the rigid substrate if we uh, don't correct for it. Uh, so yes, I'm sure, but the problem is that to extract a quantitative modulus or, or moduli, it would be difficult to assume unless uh, we do some finite element analysis to extract some quantitative information about the deep uh, part of the of the cell. So we are assuming that it's elastic, homogeneous, and isotropic, and it's none of it, none of those. <laughs> but I think that's that's okay for the moment. But yeah, it will depend for sure. 